Um, well, shalom everyone. This is Joy Garcia and Zen Garcia. And uh, we want to, of course, first thank you for joining us tonight for our sixth episode of Ask Me Anything with Zen Garcia. And as we decided in our previous episode, we will now be hosting our AMAs every second and fourth Friday of each month. And just as a reminder, if you have a question for a future episode, please email me at sacredwordpublishingllc at gmail.com with subject line questions for AMA. And that said, Zen, if you could start us off in prayer, that would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Father God, we just, as always, humble ourselves before you in thanksgiving for life and being in every new day, every new moment, new opportunity to be part of the grand everything, the existence with all life and all that you've created for us. It's a, a miracle just to experience any moment and to be included in just the grandness of all that you designed and all that you manifest into what is now the past and the present and the future as it all connects within this moment it's uh, it's a tremendous uh, blessing and we're just so very grateful to you for all that you've done for us all the abundance and the blessings the prosperity the chance for joy and and even though this is a world and a life of struggle still the the beauties of every moment are are there to be found for those that really seek it and so and i'm just glad that myself i've come to know you and to prioritize your kingdom and to seek your your word and your answers and all that you provided for us through the prophets the apostles and the patriarchs of old and that i feel i have at least an understanding of what you've released and made available to those that truly seek that i'm able to help others to also come to discernment um, in the manner that can bless them in their lives and and that they are able to use this to also bless in and their families and others and that is a beautiful thing in the way that it all pays for it and so we just give thanks to you again ask that you be with us in this moment and every moment and especially when we come together in fellowship in this manner to seek out and to study your word. And as always, Father, I ask that people not believe anything that I say, but that they come before you, they kneel before you, go into the prayer closet and ask you to confirm those things that we teach and that we have come to revelation upon. And just um, always thank you for everything. All praise, all honor. Uh, gratitude to you and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All righty. Our first question of the night is from Annie. And she asks, what is true most high fellowship? When will that fellowship resemble that which is described in his word? It says, um, within the scriptures that where two or more come together in his name that that truly is a gathering of worshipers a gathering of the disciples of the most high god and i believe that even in conversation or even in meal because that's what it was about early in the establishment of the church it was people that had experienced that knew of Yeshua that were touched by his presence, by his glory here upon the earth, that wanted to share and discuss with others what was going on and how many knew that he was the fulfillment of all the prophecies and that he was the true Savior Messiah, God incarnate into the flesh, and that as Savior Messiah, even though they didn't fully understand that his death on the cross is what would defeat the authority of this world. Death and decay, aging, and then the final, as far as succumbing 
to death and being under the authority of death, that he would be the way, the truth, and the light, and that he would give us through his teachings, his um, just example here, through all the prophecies of every unfolding, that for those that believed on his cross, that believed in him, that knew him as Savior Messiah, that through him we can be secured in our eternity. Because as God, he can extend that to whomever he wished. And he showed an example that he could heal, he could give to life and also take life. And he could do anything that he wished because he truly was God in the flesh, that he and the Father and the Holy Spirit were all together one. And so that was the good news. That was the the good news of that Christ had come, that the promises were fulfilled, that the the same thing he had told Adam and which Adam had passed down to all of his generations and to all of his children, that Christ would come into the flesh, be born of a virgin near Bethlehem, the town of Judea, and that he would be of the tribe of Judah, that he would be you know, a prophet in the order of Melchizedek. All these prophecies um, that were fulfilled by him, that they would cast lots for him, that they would pierce him, that he would be Emmanuel, God with us, his name meaning Yah's salvation, that it would be through him the fall would be redeemed and that we would be rectified back to life and back to our former estate. And so even now, that was the great commission that the apostles were assigned in going forth and that the Holy Spirit came to them as they were gathered. And it's the same now that the Holy Spirit comes to those that gather in his name and that worship him and that seek him and that answers to all the riddles, all the secrets of life can be can be gleaned through prayer and through the study of the gospel and through uh, seeking out relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I believe that that was the way of it then and that is the way of it now. Amen. All right. Um, our next question is from Marilyn, and she says, having studied 9-11 and World Wars 1 and 2, I have come to believe that Zionism had a major hand in the unification and rise of Israel. If you have anything more to say about this subject, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. That um, Zionism was a major aspect of even the establishment and the fomenting of those three wars um, that, you know, even Pike in his vision spoke about the need to foment these three world wars as pretext to establish and to bring forth Zionism and then to, during the aftermath of the Second World War, to establish uh, Israel and that even the agenda of the New World Order, it aligns with and it always fulfills the Father's will. And we see that in Scripture we are told uh, that Israel would be reestablished again as a nation and that that would be the sign, that would be the, the blooming of the fig tree that would mark the final generation. And so... Even though this was truly a New World Order agenda and that the Rothschild elite and the international bankers and the secret societies were in large part um, responsible as catalysts for achieving and bringing forth uh, the regathering of the House of Israel in our time, this was again still it was 
God's purpose and it was God's um, sign and the sign that he said he would achieve throughout the scriptures as being uh, the indicator, the mark for our being in the end of days. And so, yes, um, even the, as I said, as far as Israel and the people that rule over it, um, those of you that heard the show that I did with John's ex-army, I explained how the Illuminati control Israel and that even though many people and the Christians, majority mainstream Christians, they teach that to go against Israel is to go against God. What you have to understand is the difference between Israel and what Israel is spoken of within the scriptures. Because true Israel is the seed of promise, the children of Adam, those that are the descendants of Abraham, and that have been the uh, bloodline which through Christ would come, and that would fulfill the prophecies found in Genesis 3.15 of the seed of the woman crushing the head of the seed of the serpent at the same time that the seed of the serpent is nipping at his heel. Because what we find in government and with the ruling elite of the world today and those that sit on the thrones of the world that print the money and loan it to the governments and that rule and run the stock exchanges and manipulate them for their own benefit that make money out of nothing and loan it to governments at interest and force people to pay down these massive amounts of debt um, through the wages and earnings and the taxes that are imposed upon them. That's the kind of authority, that's the kind of power, the kind of control that the I at the top of the Illuminati pyramid, because truly this is a spiritual war and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but the powers, the principalities, the rulers of darkness, wickedness in high places. And as you see on <laughs> all of our currency, on the dollar bills, $5 bills, $10 bills, no matter what amount the currency is, you will see the Masonic uh, pyramid with the eye, the capstone, detached from the rest of the brick and mortars pyramid. And that, in my opinion, is indicative of the spiritual forces, uh, the odds behind the mass, Satan and the rebel angels that rebelled against the Most High and that have been fomenting and fighting um, the, the war uh, in heaven and here now on the earth, that it's a continuation of that. And it's still unfolding and will continue that God has given them temporary reprieve and temporary opportunity for them to uh, attempt to achieve what they have planned, and that is to have a kingdom and have a uh, rule over man. Um, and God, again, has given them free will and chance and opportunity to do this. And the reason he has done this is because it teaches us all that we are learning through the unfolding of this dream as it plays out why we need him, why we need a sovereign God that is compassionate, just, and loving, and that cares for us and takes care of the meek and watches over the poor and that feeds everybody without, uh, without favor to any. But that's why we need God to really run and to control the creation. Otherwise, we would create the chaos that we see that we are living in and that we see manifest and being propagated daily in our world. I mean, it's insane. I just saw um, a, a show not long ago, um, one of the shows that Cleo likes to watch when we do range of motion and such. Um, 
but there was an individual uh, he had bipolar but he for whatever reason he hated homeless people and for a long time he would just run over them like jump the curve and run over homeless people just to kill them and for no reason at all not even knowing them but that's the kind of insanity that we are dealing with in this world and people simply are losing it and we're now at a point where um, there's so much uncertainty because you, there's just no stability when it comes to the minds of people that they are lost in their worlds and there's been so much abuse and generational curses and that people are truly lost and uh, separated from God in such a way that insanity rules in this world. And it's a lot worse than we even know, than we are even being told. Um, a lot of what are the major terrorist events aren't even reported upon. And, you know, we're kept in the dark about a lot of what is happening in the world because there's major areas of conflict and uh, things going on behind the scenes which we don't know. But again, with regard to Zionism and um, Jerusalem, even in Zechariah 12, it, it says that Jerusalem would be a cup of trembling amongst the nations. And so when they created Jerusalem and, I mean, it created Israel and sent the Jews in to take over the Palestinians' land and to cast those people forth, from their homes i mean can you imagine the kind of angst and the kind of hate that the palestinian people would have towards those um the those that came in to take their land and to take their homes and to you know just pretty much occupy their what was their livelihood and their dreams and so that is the kind of cup of trembling the kind of hate and the kind of division that was created in that time and it's been since israel has become a nation that the the war again between ishmael and um and isaac because that's where it goes back to you see that ishmael and isaac are the the bloodlines of these two different peoples and they're half cousins, half brothers, and even David and Goliath, they, um, you know, they were also cousins as well. But it shows to us that the division is has been since the Cain and Abel, and will continue until the end of day, as Christ said, "Let both grow together until the time of the end." That the tares who are the children of the wicked one the enemy that snuck into the garden, the devil, uh, that they would wage war against humanity, against the seed of the woman, until the time of the end. And this is why things will continue in such capacity until Christ comes in second advent. But the most important thing to understand about all of this is that the establishment for Jerusalem and the conflict and that it will set the stage for World War III and also um, for you know a, a, an armed struggle that we can't even imagine. All the people that died in World War I and World War II, this third conflict is to be, you know, it, it says that it would decimate um, the Muslims and the Christians and also the uh, atheists and the nihilists that they would come in and take over this power vacuum, but all of this would be done in order to establish the the reign of the Antichrist and that this false messiah would come upon the scene and would restore peace to the world and that they would unify it in a one world religion, a one world order, a one world economy. Um, and we see this already established and in place. It's just a matter of you know, taking out the strongest countries that are opposed to complete United Nations rule, which America is the largest stumbling block in uh, in that particular 
uh, picture, but they have weakened us so tremendously that it, it really it wouldn't take anything to topple America that they could shut us down. Uh, even the government right now, you know, is is going through a major shutdown and people are suffering, uh, not getting paid and have no idea as to how they're going to manage, how they're going to make it. And so that's how delicate the situation is for a lot of people. Yes, thank you for that. And... Your next question is I, uh, from Iraq. Um, they ask, please explain the moments in the garden with the fruit and what specifically happened. That's a really good question, and it's one that people should truly understand. And I'll explain it again. Um, even though I've got numerous shows that people can go to look to to get um, – understanding but yet i'll i'll bring it forth here that what happened when adam and eve when eve was tempted to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that there truly was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and it truly did have fruit it says that uh, the fruit was kind of a, a vine a grapevine and it had clusters of fruit in such manner and that when they ate of it their eyes and their minds were open um, it's my opinion that what God had told them to not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that when they did in that day they should die that what happened is they were transformed into flesh and they lost their immortal bright natures and that when they were transformed into flesh and they had their minds open, that that was the moment and that was the opportunity that Samael, the angel of death, Satan, the adversary of humanity, took advantage of. That Adam and Eve, not understanding sexuality, not understanding physical, um, you know, as far as having a physical nature, that he basically seduced Eve and neither of them knew really what was going on or what he was doing but he led Eve through the act of basically procreation and seducing her um, that when Adam ate and shared the fruit with her that this is the act that he repeated with her and this is why it says that after they had eaten this fruit, that you know their eyes and their minds were open, that they covered their genitals, that they sewed uh, cinctures of fig leaves to cover their private parts, because they knew they had done exactly what the Most High had told them not to. And now that they had fallen, they were under the authority of death, and that... Um, they had been promiscuous and they knew it uh, because before then it's my opinion that and i show this in um uh, in my 12th book i think it's the 12th one the great contest two enmity between the seed lines i go through the story of genesis 3 4 and 5 in very great detail and i parallel the accounts that are brought forth from the Septuagint, the Targum, the King James, and then other books of commentary. And I show to you that, in fact, what exactly happened. And that it's, again, my, parent, uh, my opinion that when they ate this fruit, that then their bodies were transformed into the flesh. Their private parts became, first appeared, and they that's when again satan seduced them and introduced them to pleasure and lust and that's when eve was impregnated with cain who was of that wicked one the word of there being son of child of progeny of or descendant of and then her eating 
and repeating the act with Adam is what brought forth Abel. And so these two twins, whether it was, you know, just fraternal twins and that the two boys were born, but in other stories it says that they may have been part of quintuplets and that each was born with a twin sister. Uh, in some of the other books, the Jubilees and Jasher and the first book of Adam and Eve, it speaks of them as being born with twin sisters. But whatever the case, um, the results of them eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was that Eve would bring forth children and bear children in sorrowful childbirth. And that we see that in the punishments of Genesis chapter 3, 15 through 17, that this is exactly what God tells them, that because you have done this, then now, all of a sudden, the serpent is going to have his own bloodline, his own seed, his own children here upon the earth where they will be banished to. And that there's going to be enmity between these two bloodlines, the children of Adam and the children of the wicked one. And that they would be at enmity, extreme hatred is what it, the word means. Extreme hatred. They would be at enmity with one another until the time of the end. And that, you know, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent as the seed of the serpent would nip at the heel of the woman. And so then, you know, to Eve, God tells her, because you ate, Eve, I warned you not to. I told you to stay away from that tree, not to eat of it. Not only are you under the authority of death, but now you're going to bring forth children in sorrowful uh, in uh, childbirth. And it's going to be a painful experience for you. But, you know, this is the path you chose. This is the path you have taken. And now that you are in fallen form and in, of a physical nature, I have to cast you and Adam out of paradise. I can't allow you to stay here because you have to be redeemed. And if you eat from the tree of the life, uh, tree of life in this state and in this form, well, then you're forever going to be fallen. And we just can't have that. And so the immortals, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they cast them forth. They place the two cherubim uh, as protectors of the tree of life, uh, preventing humanity or anybody in a fallen state from going forth um, to uh, to paradise to you know have capacity or possibility to eat and they are cast down here to the earth where the serpent and the rebel angels were already banished and we see in the first book of adam and eve that they are here living among the devils and the demons and that they initially had no idea as to what it even meant to walk that i'm guessing that in our immortal bright nature that we can basically will ourselves to float from one point to the other but here in physical form they had to walk which was extremely strange to them they felt the the fury of sunshine and were exposed to heat and to cold, to light, and to darkness. And these were exotic experiences for them as well. They did not understand hunger and thirst, nor did they know what it meant to be hungry or thirsty. And yet, you know, these were things that because they were now in an animalistic nature, that they would have to feed and they would have to... Uh, live through night and day, sleep and dreams, and also, you know, embrace all of the uh, other bodily functions that came with being cast out and being banished here into physicality. And so these things are revealed in great detail when you study the fullness of Scripture. But yet, you know, most people don't even understand that 
we were cast down and cast away from paradise, which is why Christ says, Remember from whence thou art fallen, and that the place of the righteous is above the firmament, above the vaulted dome, the heavenly temple, the throne room of the Most High God. That's where the righteous are. That's where New Jerusalem is, and that at the end of days, New Jerusalem will descend out of the heavens, and that God will dwell with us here upon the earth for what will be the millennial reign and the day of rest. Because uh, we see that in Scripture we are told that a day is as a thousand years, and that right now we've been given, as far as modern humanity, uh, a timeline of 6,000 years, 120 jubilees, and that the at the end of this timeline, whenever God chooses that it is fulfilled and that Christ will come again in Second Advent, then we would um, we would have the Sabbath day of rest, that thousand years of rest, and then Satan would be loosed once more to challenge again uh, before he is consumed in what will be the outer darkness and the annihilating fire of the second death. And then at that time, evil, death, and all the things of the former things will have passed away. And there will be an eternal reign of goodness and beauty. And we will understand through the experience of this lifetime and this whole time cycle and this whole story um, why it is that God won't, uh, won't suffer to allow, um, you know, wickedness and evil and stubbornness and pride and also rebellion against his authority. Why he, why he can't afford to allow that to continue and to exist. And we will understand because the story of what we are going through will be spoken about and told and remembered into eternity. And we'll forever remember those days when we existed in fallen form, when we lived in a fallen world and we lived through the duality of good and evil. And we'll talk about these days as if they were our ancient past, because at some point they will be, and what a beautiful time that will be. And what glorious tales we will share together in remembrance of those things that are now. Most definitely. Uh, the next question is from Iraqwell. Does the father have a physical form? Uh, yes, in my opinion, what we see as the entirety of creation is the physicality of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because nothing can exist outside of them, and all things are from them. They are the source, the force, and everything is from, essentially, at its highest vibration, light. And that the invisible, the ethereal, the spiritual is what is the Most High God. And everything stepping down in sound, vibration, frequency to take on physicality, that that still all is a portion of what is the fabric of the Godhead. And so everywhere you look, there you see God. Amen. Uh, last question from Iraq. Well, he uh, says the calendar. I understand the solar and lunar aspect. I have purchased your calendar and I'm so grateful this issue is finally revealed. However, my question is about the zodiac. Do these constellations pass overhead all night and where do we look for them? Yes, anywhere you look into the evening sky, anywhere you look up into the celestial night there you see the constellations and they are revolving in circularity just as the sun the moon and the other planets they are all moving in perpetuity 
in circle around North Star as the fixed center, as the place where the Most High has established his throne and his heavenly temple. And so, yes, below the vaulted dome, below the firmament, the constellations circle because those are the angels. They are all established in pattern and they are all encircling his throne room uh, and they all bow f before him in worship and perpetual prayer. They It tells us that they are singing daily and nightly in giving thanks to the Mohasai even for their own being. And that's the way that the creation is established. And we see that even here on the earth, that in the mornings when the sun first makes visible appearance into um, our waking day, that all of the creatures come out in serenade to sing, to give thanks, and to uh, praise the Most High uh, in their voices, in their chatter, in their cacophony of voices. Um, the, you hear the, the toads and the cicadas and uh, all the, the creatures. They're all singing together. And humanity, the way that we sing is that, you know, we get into our cars and we drive to work and uh, there's this you know, perpetual sound of cars moving in on the freeways and going to work. Um, but I guess that's part of our joining the serenade of voices, but we don't, we don't really, um, even realize as to what's going on. And then in the evening, it's the same way. And, um, Jim Morrison in his poetry, he called this the soft parade. And in the evenings at twilight, when the day is transitioning into night and the glory of bright light and sunshine is given away to night and her purple legions. We see the stars make appearance and Venus and some of the planets and, and then the constellations. And um, what an incredible transition. But during that time, you see the same thing, that the reverse of day is happening, that the animals, the creatures, the owls, um, you know, the the toads and the frogs and all they come out to sing and to serenade God in thanksgiving for another day. And it's beautiful the way that the harmony, the procession of uh, day occurs. And in the upper heavens, in the celestial um, in way up there, the same thing is going on. These same kind of songs, these same kind of prayers. And the stars, the angels singing to the Most High that we are told even lucifer he was you know before he fell before iniquity was found within him he was the leader of the choir of the angelic choir and that he had mighty voice and that he was given incredible song and that he used to sing in beauty unmatched by any of the angels and that they were really blown away by his praise but you know, that when he rebelled and he fell, then all that was for naught. But we are, we're told about that even in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 of, you know, how he was at one time the leader of the angelic choirs. All right, thank you. And your next question is from Alette. Uh, she asks, Paul states that he has a thorn in his flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. Does any of the extra biblical texts say what issue he had? Um, Do you want me to read 7 to 9? 2 Corinthians? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. All right. So 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9 says, or because of these surpassingly great revelations there in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. for My power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. I remember reading in the Great Commission, uh, because those are the books that we put together and that compile, uh, that talk about the apostles going forth two by two in journey and in fulfilling the Great Commission to take the gospel to all the different parts of the world. And I remember Paul speaking of, in, and I'm not sure as to which text, but of being tormented in some manner physically. Now, what that is, I can't remember exactly, but for those of you that do have the Great Commission books one and two, I do believe that it is within them that you will find answer to this particular um, question and that you may get greater clarity there. But as right now, I, I can't say um, or, you know, detail as to what that was. Just to clarify, do you, when you say Great Commission 1 and 2, do you, is it Great Contest 1 and 2 or Great Commission 1 through 3? No, the Great Commission the 3 is two. about the apocalyptic oh, so just the end times. the first two Great so Commissions. Just the first two Great Commissions. Got it. Because the first mm -hmm. two Great Commissions are about the apostles going forth two by two to take the, uh, to teach the gospel to all the nations of the world. And the third book of the Great Commission is specific to those texts and those writings and those ancient manuscripts, which are solely about the end times and are, are being the last generation. Great. Thank you. Um, next question is also from Paulette. She asks, regarding predestination, can someone be predestined to be here, but because of an abortion slash miscarriage, the person wasn't permitted to enter the world? Or was it that they were predestined to be aborted or miscarried, perhaps, because of their degree of offense during when the rebellion with Satan before we were all sent to earth? I would actually turn that around, Paulette, and that instead of it being a curse, that God would actually consider that, that those people are blessed because now they are in heaven. They never had to come through the struggle of life and being. And I'll tell you a story, because um, I covered this in a show. I don't remember exactly what the show was, but um, this individual, he was a great disciple of the Most High God. And he loved his daughter so very much, and he asked Peter to bless her um, in the greatest way that he could. And uh, Peter, you know, asked him, are you sure that this is what you want? And because he already had foresight of what would happen. And he said, yes. And so Peter then asked the Most High to, to bless his daughter. And she passed away that night. And the father being so sorrowful and not understanding that that was the most beautiful blessing that God could give unto her because she was also a beautiful girl. And um, that he then begged Peter to resurrect her and to bring her back to life and to bring her back to him and to this lifetime. And so Peter did. And upon doing so, um, she ended up being raped and then also. Um, ended up becoming sort of like an invalid in that she was um, somehow she was challenged physically and unable to walk in some manner, whatever it was. And then, you know, the guy understood that sparing her of all of that was really the greatest gift. And so in my opinion, there are no, no, coincidences and everything is for reason and so those that because of abortion or because of miscarriage that don't have to come into this lifetime into this world that that truly is the greatest blessing 
even though we don't understand it that way. And for us here, it does not make sense that way. Um, that truly the angels understanding the beginning, the end and the beginning and being up there in paradise and being with the most high now and not having to come into the challenge of flesh that this life is d difficult. And as much as there are blessings poured upon us in living and reaping the experience of every day, um, you know, a lot of people would rather not have ever had to come and, uh, and, and you know, and just explaining it from, um, from the stories that, because I, I believe these, these stories are also found in the Great Commission 1 and 2, what I'm talking about. And for even individuals like myself, uh, the disability that I have and the difficulties of just everyday simple life. And now for so many, you know, so many people are struggling, uh, whether it's physical or mental disabilities or emotional or spiritual or whatever. So many people are having a difficult time of life and just maintaining uh, their sanity and in holding on to their joy in the face of what we are being contended with as far as the new world order and coming to um, understanding that, you know, the spiritual, um, the forces of darkness, the wickedness in high places that they truly have authority here in this world and that the elites that they are above the law and they can do anything that they want and that even the justice systems and the uh, you know the health institutions that have been supposedly established to take care of the people that they are doing things like starving and dehydrating people and um, killing people to take their organs and vaccinating them against their will and causing disease and giving them perpetual lifelong conditions uh, cancer viruses being given to children that you know, not even a year old. I mean, the injustice of this world um, that in in the spiritual world, they understand that and a lot of them would never have wanted to come here. And a lot of us um, understanding truly the way things were, we would have given it second thought. But um, But still, the glory is to come into the flesh to be born, to endure the struggle until the end, and to serve the Most High God in the face of all of these odds, in the face of all of this evil and all of this wickedness, and to stand for His truth, and to not bend to the will or the influence of evil, that to fear nothing but the Most High God, you know, to fear not serving Him and not um doing his will and being a servant unto the kingdom that um truly for those that have the eyes to see the ears to hear and the mind to understand what i'm saying will make sense to you but for a lot of people i don't i don't think i could ever no matter what kind of words i use that i could convey this message in a way that would illustrate or make it make sense in a manner that they could relate to it because we, you know, see life as the greatest blessing. Right. Very deep. Um, right. So Poppy was asking a follow-up question, which it says, are these the holy ones never sinned in flesh? And so I, I, I was thinking, the question is, are you asking, so if, are those who never sinned in flesh, are they the holy one? I think that's what they're asking, but I'm not, I'm not. Yes, so, they're, so what they're asking is, the ones that were aborted, are they considered the holy ones, considering they never sinned in flesh? 
yeah, I would I would say that they are the ones that are truly blessed and that they their election determined that they should not have to come into the world and endure what we have. And I would say that they were probably the one third of the angels of the Most High, which fought with him and sided with him and even the war in heaven during our pre-existence. And that because of their determination and their election during that first world age, that God, um, you know, basically spared them from having to come into and endure the temptations of this world. Because it is, you know, this world is difficult and it's the greatest struggle to overcome. Even the the whole sin of the flesh, the lust of the body, that is a difficult thing to contend with and to deal with on a daily basis. And to hold sexuality in a sacred manner and to treat it as such throughout your lifetime, that that is a, a difficulty which most people are are not able to achieve and that they will be holy in every way except for when it comes to their sexuality and then they will allow themselves to indulge in pleasure or to you know whatever in in such manner that just like the fallen angels in the show that i did about the watchers being a, mating with the daughters of cain even they, you know, the these 200 angels making, um, challenging Yeshua to put them in the flesh form and having them told that, you know, Christ telling them, all right, I'm going to put you in the flesh, but if you fall away, then my judgment is going to be severe upon you. So severe that you will lose your immortality immortality your eternity and be judged and condemned um, for your actions but if you do um, succeed and you you know stand with me and you know teach the children of God about the the kingdom and who I am and bring them answers and understand on the heavenly mysteries then you will sit before me on the right hand beside my father and that was the greatest glory that they could be given because basically uh, Christ was telling them that I'm going to make you foremost in the celestial kingdom I'm going to make you my right hand like what Michael the archangel is now that that kind of authority would be given to these watcher angels and yet as soon as they came down they saw the dancing and the orgies and the daughters of Cain involved in all kind of an abomination with, you know, the, all the things that are mentioned as to the, what they were doing and the sexual pleasures they were taking and indulging it in. And they made a pact. They made a pact then to commit this sin. Even they they knew the circumstances. And even though they knew they just had left their place of habitation, they had just arrived here into flesh form. But yet the call of sexuality, the the for them to indulge in the sin of uh, lust was so great that they gave up their immortality and their chance to be the greatest and the foremost amongst the archangels. And that's how great the call of carnality is. And so for all that are coming into the flesh, that are born into this world, that take on a physical nature, that are challenged uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and sexually, this is the greatest challenge to overcome and not to fall away. Even Adam and Eve, you know, the sin of eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was sexual in nature. It caused them to be cast out 
even though they didn't understand they didn't know what they were doing and still yet it shows you that you know the the call to indulge in sexuality causes even the angels to lose their first estate and caused humanity also to lose our first estate and so you know for a lot of people it, it's um almost near impossible to overcome and for a lot of people that will be the one thing that they have difficulty in uh maintaining uh, and holding stable and keeping sacred all right it is nine fifty-eight. do you want to take a break then so you can get some water and relax yes. your voice for a second <laughs> Yes, I'll be right back. Thank you. Okay, sure. And while Zen gets something to Come drink, um, I just wanted to let you guys know about just a couple new features that we added to our site. Um, first, and I'm not sure, maybe you guys have noticed this already, but uh, you can now preview the first chapters of each of our books to get a better idea of the layout and the content. Um, so if you just click on to a product and you scroll down and below the description, you see preview this book now in a hyperlink and you can just click that and read the first chapter. And then um, second, you can now review our books on our website. And that is also if you click on the product and you scroll down um, all the way past the description, you will see the customer reviews. If you guys could just take two minutes of your time to write a review directly on our website, that would really help us um, and the rest of the community to better understand which books will be the greatest blessings for them. And I know a lot of people just just have just curious about you know people's experiences with books and things like that. So that would be greatly appreciated. And to say thank you um, for each review that you write, we will send a 20% off one book code for each review. So if you write two, you can get two books for 20% off and so on and so forth. And then uh, lastly, we now offer international shipping, which is very exciting um, and new for us. But if you don't see your country when checking out, uh, please let us know and we can try to, our best to accommodate. So, so that's it for me. I can hear that you're back, Zen. Yeah. Great. All right. So. Oh, um, your next question is from Good Time John. Do you think the Holy Spirit placed Jesus in Mary's womb fully conceived, or did he have Mary's DNA? Okay, this is a good question as well. And it's something that a lot of people, um, because I do teach that the Holy Spirit is female, that they, you know, are quick to bring up this point well if the holy spirit is female how is it that she could overshadow mary and then bring forth the conception of christ well to understand the end to bring and under, you know bring this story to greater clarity one must understand that christ as god did not need anybody to um to cause his birth or his conception that he simply, as you will see when you read what is the book called The Ascension of Isaiah, that Isaiah was taken up into the heavens and was shown in vision that Christ would come into flesh and that he would descend down through the heavens and that descending down through the heavens, he would conceal his, uh, his presence, his embodiment, as to who he was, and that he would enter into Mary of his own volition, and that being born of the Virgin Mary, that he would live through the lifetime and being crucified, dying on the cross, that he would then free the descendants of Adam that were bound in the terror of Sheol. And Isaiah, we know, is the prophet, the Old Testament prophet, which wrote most about the coming of Christ and that there are numerous prophecies contained within the 66 chapters of his uh, book 
of, of the Old Testament book uh, that are prophetic in nature and deal with what he had seen in this particular vision of how Christ would you know be born of a virgin and that he would be born near and around Bethlehem and the other details that um, he released within his manuscript. And so I'll read something to bring greater understanding to this particular story. But also, if you look at the book that we wrote called Yahushua Christ, the uh, infancy, early childhood, and the lost years, which speak about in greater detail the child, you know, the infancy, um, the early childhood of Christ, um, even when, even contains in great detail the stories of Mary and her special and unique character, and of also of how her parents, Joachim and Hannah, like uh, Sarah and Abraham, that they were barren into their old age, and that they were very holy and righteous people, and that the Most High opened her womb in the same manner that when Isaac was born, there was great celebration. It was the same thing for when Mary was born. There was great celebration, and there was promise by Joachim and Anna to dedicate her unto the temple. And there Mary stayed, and she was and had known and was fed by the uh, in, in the relationship and by the hands of the angels all throughout her childhood, and that she was very special, and that she knew the higher angelic authorities all throughout her life. It was nothing for her to have an encounter with and to you know, to meet with and to converse with angels. This was something that uh, happened to her readily all throughout her lifetime. And so she had dedicated herself unto perpetual virginity. And she wanted only to be married to her service to God. And so God, because of her commitment, uh, chose her to then be the vehicle for what would be the Immaculate Conception. And it's also misunderstood that in the scriptures, many people believe that Mary brought forth other children and that her and Joseph were intimate. But when you read the books and the stories that we have compiled, you will see that Joseph was already an elderly widowed man when he was given to be caretaker unto Mary. And that she was a 16-year-old virgin when he received her out of the temple. And he had already had children that were older than she was. She had two daughters and six boys from her previous marriage. And that he was instructed to be her guardian. Um, and that he was going to put her away when he came back after six months of working out in the field doing carpentry and building houses, he was involved in construction, that he finding her Mary, he was going to secretly, you know, send her away so not to bring shame upon her. But he was told in a dream that 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 was within her was, you know, God, um, the Savior Messiah, Yahushua, Emmanuel, God with us. And so then he, you know, he realized that, um, she was special and that what was happening to them was special and that they were tested and they were uh, forced to drink these bitter waters that are spoken about in Deuteronomy and it was proven that they were not lying and that uh, he did not sleep with her and that that which was coming forth from her was of God and was of special significance for Israel. And so even during that test, Everybody knew, those that understood the signs, uh, knew that she was to bring forth the Savior Messiah. Even Simeon, who was the high priest but was struck dumb at that time, he was unable to speak. And he, was, he had shared a prophecy that he would receive voice again when he saw the Savior Messiah. And when Christ was born on the eighth day, when they 
brought him into the temple to be uh, circumcised, uh, Simeon received his voice again. And then after conducting the ritual, uh, he passed away. And that was also a sign to Israel that the Savior Messiah had been born. Um, and other things that a lot of people don't understand, um, that when Abraham had went into, after being led away from Babylon and he had returned, um, after taking lesson and learning from uh, Shem and Noah and being interned into the order of the ancients and being taught to be high priest in that particular order, that when he returned to Babylon, all the idols fell before him and that this happened where he went a lot of times the idols fell well this same thing happened during the life and even the infancy of christ for instance when um when yeshua and mary and, and joseph fled to egypt when you know he's two years old that the people of the town would often run him out because all their idols would fall on their faces before him. And so, you know, this was something that their gods bowing before him, um, this was something that, you know, was indicative, again, of him being God incarnate, Savior Messiah. And so uh, reading from the Gospel of Philip, it says, Some said Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. They are in error. They do not know what they are saying. When did a woman ever conceive by a woman? So here it's telling you that the Holy Spirit is feminine. Mary is the virgin whom no power defiled. She is a great anathema to the Hebrews, who are the apostles and the apostolic men. This virgin whom no power defiled, and then it's broken. Um, the powers defile themselves. And so we are told here in this particular passage that the Holy Spirit, did, was not responsible for her conceiving and that the holy spirit being feminine couldn't have enacted or you know brought forth her conception anyways but when we read in the story of um uh, the his, the history of joseph the carpenter we see that christ tells us that he basically incarnated of himself he entered into the flesh let me see if I can find this story. I'm going to look it up real quick. Just give me one minute. Let's see if I can find this no story. No problem. Sounds good. And while you're looking, Stephanie says, I believe Mary was a surrogate and Yahushua did not actually have have her DNA. Therefore, the Son of God, Son of Man, belongs to humanity through adoption. Yes. Okay, let's see here. I may not actually have it in this particular selection. And if I don't, people can just read it for themselves by going to the history of Joseph the Carpenter. And you'll read where basically, actually, I can look it up in that text. It won't take me long to find it. Uh, do you want to ask me the next question just while I am looking? Sure. There? Yeah, I can do that. Um, the next question is from MC8119, who asks, I was wondering if the placement of the moon had anything to do with mood changes and personality types. I'm aware of the zodiac and the saying people that the saying people being moonstruck, but I was wondering if there was a true Yeshua perspective on this. Um, I know that the moon you know, has influence upon all of us in some manner that especially even um, all of the planets have influence on us just as the sun, the moon, the planets, and all the constellations, the zodiac, and that this is even the 
reasoning for why astrology became a science and that Adam was the first he was instructed in the knowledge of the stars the signs um, and their influence upon humanity he was given as part of the book of creations um, the book of the signs and the book of uh, the generations of humanity um, also the book of the wars of the lord there were five different books that were given to him but anyways in that whenever something occurred in the the stars like for instance when abel was killed by his brother cain there was a a, a huge sign of this comet seen in the heavens and he was able to look it up and to discover its meaning within this particular book and so this book was also passed on to enoch and i believe that you know, what we see in the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries is the angel Uriel giving him confirmation of what was found and what he basically was studying in the book of the signs that was given to him by Adam. And um, and these books were passed down through the generations to all the different um Oh, I'm sorry, I'm still looking this up. Uh, to all the different patriarchs and the prophets. And so this knowledge and what would happen in the stars and how to interpret it, that even the Egyptians speak about how it was Abraham that revealed to them and explained to him, to them how to understand what was occurring in the heavens. And so, yes, the sun, the moon, the stars... All of them have different influence. I reveal this in my book, um, Paradise, the Sides of the North and the Mouth of the Congregation, and even in the newest book that we released on my notes for the Flat Earth Convention. There's a portion in there that speaks about the seven heavens and the influence of um, the sun, the moon, and and the different planets, the um, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter, and what influence they are supposed to hold both individually and collectively over humanity and the zodiac as well. Because that's why you see that with the zodiac signs, that uh, they will do a chart as far as the astrological chart. They will time when it is a person enters into this world. They will look at where all the different stars and where all the different, the sun and the moon and these other uh, planet planets and heavenly bodies, where they were, what constellation they were during the time that you were born. And in that way, they are able to come up with a basic of how a person should be and the kind of predominant uh, characteristics that they will have just because of the they're being born under those particular signs and so that's why you know the astrology chart there's some basis in truth for its particular uh, concept as a pseudoscience however the it's been tied to and throughout history the these astrological sciences have been usurped by Satan and they have been um, unified to the worship of the fallen angels. And so that's why we see that the Most High God uh, condemns the study of, and, and it's not really the study of these particular, you know, this particular pseudoscience, but that they were offering their children in sacrifice or that they were you know, doing blood sacrifice or victim sacrifice, or they were indulging in orgies. All the abominations that all the pagan religions and the cultures involved themselves with because they had usurped even uh, astrology as a pseudoscience, it became associated with such abomination. And that's what the Most High God was against. And so, 
but yes, the all of the luminaries have influence upon us. All right, let me see here. Okay. Do you want me to ask you another one, or do you want to focus on let me, finding? Uh, let me focus. On this. <laughs> Sounds good. I've I can't do two up. things at once yeah. either. <laughs> Although you're pretty good at it, Zen, considering <laughs> when you are like doing your radio shows and things, and then you start reading. From like what seems like I don't know how did you find that text so fast <laughs> the exact passage that you're looking for? I've always thought that that must be, you know, a gift that must be uh, helping you. <laughs> yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, I uh, had to learn to do that. All right, here uh, it says here in <laughs> passage four and five it says. The history of Joseph the carpenter. Therefore, they immediately sent out and assembled twelve old men of the tribe of Judah, and they wrote down the names of the twelve tribes of Judah. And the lot fell upon the pious old man, righteous Joseph. Then the priests answered and said to my blessed mother, Go with Joseph, and be with him till the time of your marriage. Righteous Joseph therefore received my mother and led her away to his own house. And Mary found James the less in his father's house, brokenhearted and sad on the account of the loss of his mother. And she brought him up. Hence, Mary was called the mother of James. James is um, the half-brother of Christ, his stepbrother. And he's also became the first bishop of the Jerusalem church. And he's one of those that wrote the infancy gospels, the Protoevangelium of James is attributed to him but he was closest in age to christ and thereafter joseph left her at home and went away to the shop where he wrought at his trade of a carpenter and after the holy virgin had spent two years in his house her age was exactly 14 years including the time at which he received her and i chose her of my own will with the concurrence of my father and the counsel of the holy spirit and i was made flesh of her by a mystery which transcends the grasp of created reason. And three months after her conception, the righteous man Joseph returned from the place he worked at his trade. And when he found my virgin mother pregnant, he was greatly perplexed and thought of sending her away secretly. But from fear and sorrow and the anguish of his heart, he could endure either, neither to eat nor drink that day. But at midday there appeared to him in a dream the prince of the angels, the holy Gabriel, furnished with the command from my father. And he said to him, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take Mary as thy wife, for she has conceived of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son whose name shall be called Jesus. He it is who shall rule all nations with a rod of iron. Having thus spoken, the angel departed from him, and Joseph rose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord had said to him and Mary abode with him. So my whole conception of this is that just like the way that Christ, when he was brought forth as the light, we see in Genesis chapter one, uh, verses one, two, and three, that God created the heavens and the earth. And then the spirit of God was hovered over the darkness that that represents the Holy Spirit. And then we see that God says, let there be light, and the light is called forth, and that, that is Christ. That we see the Father the, and the Holy Spirit present at even the bringing forth of Christ as the light of the world. And then also when he is baptized at the time of his baptism, that we see the Father, you hear the audible voice of the Father just as he said, let there be light. And then the dove as the Holy Spirit is present there for his baptism. And then, you know, the the power uh, comes upon him and being Christ, that in the same manner that we see the same thing with the conception of, um, I mean, the bringing forth the birth of Christ, that when you read the stories that are contained in this uh, Yahushua Christ um, 
Infancy Gospels book, you see that the seed of uh, Seth, the Magi, they were led by what is the the star of Bethlehem, who is Christ himself descending down through the regions of the world. Uh, and that is, you, this prophecy was given to them even by their great forefather, Adam. He told them that at a certain time, Christ is going to come and be born of the world. And he's going to lead you first to the cave of treasures where you're going to gather together the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh that he gave me when he banished me out of paradise. And you're going to bring these as gifts to him when he is born into this world. And then he's going to leave you to the cave that Mary uh, is going to be bringing him forth in Immaculate Conception. And that this all occurred prophetically, that even the shepherds were there. The shepherds, the Magi, um, Joseph and Mary, and other, um, as far as the Salome and a midwife. And then we see that the... The place, the cave, was like a sanctuary in that it was also filled with the celestial beings. That all of the high angels, the hierarchy of the celestial and divine angels, that they were there and it was you know, a moment of church. It was a, a sanctuary. Christ was coming to leave the celestial realms to be born of the flesh and to take on flesh embodiment. And then afterwards, you know, it shows in the stories that Salome verified that Mary, even after the conception of Christ, was still a virgin. And that the reason she was called, you know, the Virgin Mother and the Holy Virgin, and uh, it was because she truly was a perpetual virgin all throughout her life. She never knew a man and had never conceived um even of a, you know, flesh, never indulged sexually with any man. And even that which was born of her was born in a spiritual manner that, uh, in my opinion, Christ took on embodiment, entered into her, and came out of her of his own volition. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, next question is from MC8119 as well. Also, for anyone new to your teachings and wanting to read all your books, which do you recommend to read first? Uh, to get a general overview, I recommend the two great contests, book one, uh, The War in Heaven, and the second one, The Enmity Between the Seed Lines, to understand this bloodline war and how its roots uh, go back to the division of light and darkness and the rebellion of the angels and the establishment of legion as the temporary rulers of you know the archons the demiurgs the um, the temporary rulers over this fallen world that that will help you to understand even where we are with regard to the new world order and the elites and their bloodline ties to satan and how they are warring against the seed of adam and why we see you know, the perpetuity of um, chaos and evil and that, you know, some of the bloodline elites uh, ruling with impunity and being above the law, those, those kind of things. It'll help you to understand and to make sense of uh, even the current nature of the world around us. Um, but the other thing that I make mention is for a lot of people that discover my work, many of you are already advanced in your seeking and you're already advanced in your studies. And so I would recommend that you cater to what your interests are. If you are trying to learn about and understand in greater detail, for instance, about Flat Earth Cosmology, then there's many books especially the trilogy that I wrote, The Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch, The Firmament Vaulted Dome of the Earth, and Paradise, Sides of the North and the Mount of the Congregation, that those would be essential for your study of that particular topic. Um, those of you that are interested in the books of Enoch, the collected works of Enoch would be a really 
incredible addition to your study of Enoch and who he was, as well as all the books that we have of his that are available to the public, because most people think that that only includes Enoch 1, 2, and 3, but that's not the case. There are others that even recently discovered are not known by the public and not studied, and they also will add additional insight into what is the strange and ambiguous statement of Genesis chapter 6 with the sons of God uh, mating with the daughters of man and creating a race of giants known as a the men of renown, that if you want to gain greater insight into the fall of the watchers and the story of even what I was talking about earlier about the watchers taking on flesh and being uh, pushed, put into flesh and then leaving their first estate, all of that is found in, in a story called the Kebra Nagas on chapter 100 concerning the fall of the angels, which is included in that particular book. And so there's great detail on a lot of what most people don't know about that would bring greater light to that particular story. Uh, even the Book of the Giants and others are included within that. Uh, the Midrash on uh, Samael and Azaza, um, you know, those kind of texts which most people have never heard about are found in and included within those collected materials. Uh, for those that are interested in the study of the end times, the Great Commission Three. Uh, the apoc apocalyptic end time manuscripts that there are literally probably dozens of manuscripts that most people have never heard about that are specific to the study of the end times and that if you read all of this material uh, you will not only gain greater insight into the timeline and the scenario that is unfolded in Revelation in the last chapter of the book of the Bible uh, in the whole New Testament, but there even the revelation of St. John the Theologian, which is a companion book to that particular book, Revelation, it will expound upon and help bring understanding to the parables that are written in that particular book in, in the Bible and that most people are... Um, familiar with with regard to studying the end times but there are literally dozens of manuscripts which most people have never heard about that again in my opinion are specific to our being the fig tree generation and that when you study and you understand these particular books you will familiarize yourself with the end times greater in greater manner than possible with any other text out there in the world in my opinion And there's so many other collections, you know, just even like with what we were talking about. Uh, sorry to cut you off there, Joy, but no Yahushua Christ, you know, if you want to know more about the early childhood and even about the mother of Christ and the lost stories of his childhood and infancy, all of that is contained. And there's only one story in the Bible about, you know, him being 13 years old and um, the, his parents discovered him in the temple teaching the uh, the teachers there, I mean, you know, we don't get great insight into that aspect of his life. But in my opinion, those stories are so deeply moving and they absolutely affirm without a doubt that uh, Christ, even in his childhood, uh, he was the full incarnation of God into flesh form. And, you know, then there's the Great Commission 1 and 2, uh, the Testament of the Patriarchs and the Prophets, the medieval Irish Apocrypha, there's the primary Adamic literature, all the different ancient manuscripts like the Chronicles of Jeremiel, the Book of the Bee, the Cave of Treasures, and one that I've been reading in great detail lately, uh, which has been a huge blessing upon my life, is the Asitur, um, the Secret Book of Moses, which thank God for Carol translating that book and taking the time to format all the end notes and to provide all the footnotes in the manner that she did. That particular book, it, it, it reminds me of how I write in that when I bring up a story, 
I will cite all the different ancient sources that I can. And this particular book dates back to the 3rd century BC. And Moses Gaster, who is one of the um, great interpreters and linguists that translated numerous of these ancient manuscripts, he also does that within this book in that manner. And so all the stories that he's bringing forth, he's naming off all of these different books that many of them are not even available to us now. And that are texts that I've never heard about. And, you know, I've studied uh, in great deal, uh, dedicated a large majority of my life to the study of the extra biblical manuscripts. And he's naming off so many texts that I've never heard about. But the great thing about uh, his footnotes is that he gives you in great detail why it is that he's referencing them and how they apply to the story. And so the source material, just reading the source material within this particular book is absolutely fascinating. And then the, um, you know, even the introduction is, I think, maybe 100 pages long. It's very elaborate, but it tells the reason why he spent so much time doing and putting forth the effort to you know, convey all these references and all this source material in the manner that he did, as well as why he thinks this book of the the secret book of Moses is so important and so critical for people to study, and also why he believes it to be the oldest manuscript available to us, um, right uh, along with the book of Enoch which is also dated back to uh, the third century BC. So that is another, you know, really incredible, fascinating text. I do recommend people study and read from it. Uh, and then there's the Targum, you know, I mean, you can't say enough about the Targum being the first translation of the Hebrew Torah into Aramaic and being the manuscript which the Israelites studied from themselves and read in the rebuilt holy temple. I mean, if you want to get as close to the original source as you can, well, the Aramaic Targum is it. And it's older even than the Greek Septuagint. And when you read and study from this one particular resource, you basically gain insight really just about on every chapter and every verse on all kinds of ideas and concepts which are excluded from the modern English versions. And so just reading this particular text will greatly bless your life, as those of you that have joined us in our weekly Aramaic Targum studies, you know, um, just in you know going over the first 25 chapters of Genesis, how much extra detail is contained within them. And so... You know, I recommend people get and study from all of these ancient manuscripts. And, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that just because you support and purchase our work, even though we do make it easier for you to read and study, having, you know, um, put, republished everything in 14-point font. But you can find most of these texts freely available online. There are others that you can't find, like the writings of Abraham and, other books that we've published, um, especially in the manner that we've compiled, you know, these huge collections of these ancient manuscripts, but um, get all of them, study all of them. They will all greatly bless your life and they will bring you to discernment in a manner that you will be surprised um, to, to really fathom and understand. And, you know, in my work, that's my, I don't have opinion. Um, all my teachings are based upon the ancient manuscripts and I'm not fabricating or, you know, creating out of thin air what I believe in the discernment that I share. These are the things that the Holy Spirit has led me to revelation upon. And I give you all of those sources so that you can study them for yourself, so that you can go to the Most High God in prayer and ask him to confirm or nullify what I am teaching as truth. And uh, it's in that manner that, you know, all of us should be really discerning and, and being led to the truth anyways. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so you get so excited.
and we talk about ancient manuscripts. <laughs> I love them. I love it. I know. I know. I, love them so I think much. anyone will tell just by hearing the tone of your. <laughs> My favorite thing. I know. Um, okay. So, um, all right. So, next question is from Michael, and he asks created uh, the Genesis 126 creation. Was that Yahweh, the creator of God, or was it the angels fallen and or good? Uh, in my opinion, everything that is created, that is manifest, and that is given life out of nothing was created by the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Elohim, the great Elohim, being the Godhead of the Holy Trinity. The Trinity being three, and then unity being one, three and one. And so, in my opinion... Only the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have the power to bring to life out of nothing or to create from nothing. And so, yes, I do absolutely believe that the pre-Adamites spoken about in Genesis 126 and 28, that they were all created by Yahweh Elohim. And you see confirmation of this in Genesis chapter 2, verses 7. Because even though... Um, in the first chapter, the creation is said to have been established by Elohim. And I do believe that, yes, the angels did have uh, participation within the establishment of all that. And they assisted in some, you know, in some. But basically, you know, it was just uh, Yahushua singing the universe into creation. But yes, they were responsible in some manner for, you know, touching up or whatever. Um, but we see that in Genesis 2-7 that it, it says that, it reiterates that, that um, after the God, the heavens and the earth were finished, then it's restated that Yahweh Elohim established the earth and the heavens. Great. Next question. Is then in your book, Sons of God, you describe one third of the angels under Lucifer, one third under Michael, and one third under Gabriel. Where did you get these numbers and names? The only thing I could verify for sure was one third under Lucifer and the fact that Michael is an archangel. Yeah, actually, um, you know, I don't know exactly where I, I got or where I related that particular story from. Uh, but in my opinion, the one third of the angels that fell with Lucifer, the rebel angels, which are now legion, um, it they are under a hierarchy that is not just Lucifer, even though he was the most proud and the prideful, and he is the what we know to be as Satan, the adversary. Uh, that even the remaining angels, they are under the authority of the Godhead. Um, that Michael, yes, he is called the prince of the angels, and he is the warrior even for Israel, the protect, uh, the protectorate. But really, the remaining two thirds, they are all under the Godhead, and what I call the Morning Star administration. And so it's not specific that oh, Michael takes care of this one third, or Gabriel takes care of this one third. They, together with all of the other angelic hierarchy, which are servicing the Most High God, are taking care of those angels which are still aligned and serving in capacity, whether in flesh embodiment or still in our former spiritual uh, pre-existent. Because I do believe that, you know, again, like you had asked about uh, the those that were aborted or those that were um, that did not have to come into the flesh with miscarriage or whatever, that these angels are part of the elect angels and that, um, you know, they are still in their former pre-existence, um, that even coming into flesh for a short time, that they are now back in their spiritual embodiment in their, what is called their former estate. And so the forces of legion, even though they are under Satan, uh, there are still other angels. You know, we see the pantheon of gods and goddesses. Uh, we see an unholy pantheon of um, uh, 
Horus and uh, Osiris and and Isis that there is this uh, this repeat all throughout the different religions of the world about this pantheon of gods and goddesses which are connected to the rebel angels and the fallen ones and that the stories of even the Anunnaki, the Archons, they are connected to them, the Demiurge, uh, Legion. They rule over this, you know, one-third of Legion that joined them in embodiment, but that they also rule over the forces of humanity, which taking form and being embodied in the flesh that have aligned with them and that have taken blood oath to serve and to worship the Satan and the fallen angels. And so their numbers are very large. They have, you know, increased greatly um, since humanity has been born into the flesh and taken on embodiment in this world and that many have been led astray. Even those that are not fully 100% dedicated and and accept secret oath or take secret allegiances to be tied into um, legion in the capacity that we are shown, you know, like with the, the blood royal elites, those that are involved in pedophilia and murder, rape, pillage, and plunder, and sacrifice of children and the consumption of blood and cannibalism, the eating of human flesh. I mean, even those that are just led astray, that involve themselves in black magic or that are dedicated to you know, these pagan religions, earth worship, or that are witches and warlocks and um, that don't uh, know Christ as Savior Messiah. They don't know Yahushua or the reason he came, that he came to rectify the fallen, to redeem them, and to give them a chance for salvation, that hate and mock God, and that do as if they will never be judged, um, and that there will ne never ever be repercussions for their actions, that commit evil in their heart, and their mind, and their thought, and that go out daily, uh, and holding negative characteristic that treat the world in foul manner that abuse animals or you know whatever that are just very uh evilly inclined individuals even if they don't worship satan and but they don't know god still they are counted as those that will be spewed out and so a majority of this world in my opinion is you know, added to the number of the one-third of the rebel angels that fell and that are now legion. But the numbers of humanity, I would say that there are more souls, more uh, of humanity dedicated and committed to evil and that are counted with legion than there are uh, as far as those that are numbered with the elect and that are truly um, of the sheepfold, in my opinion. All right. Um, next question is from Michael as well. Do you consider some elements to the Anunnaki Nibiru wormwood and asteroid belt his belt story to be true, and that, for example, Nibiru is an actual three D material planet? No, um, I did at the time when I read that, when I had written that book on the sons of God. But um, you have to realize that I wrote that book in 2011 and 2012. I believe it was published in 2013, and that was before I had come to understanding on the biblical cosmology. And so uh, even though, you know, I wrote in great detail about those particular things with regard to the Anunnaki mythology and that like many of you I was led sway to believing them 
and to buying into them and accepting that what they had said had basis in fact and reality. For instance, those of you that don't know and have not read uh, the Zachariah Sitchin books or all the different stories on the Anunnaki, they claim uh, that their cosmology is based on a heliocentric model for understanding world, that they describe um, our solar system, uh, that their planet comes in, Nibiru comes in and crosses um, where the asteroid belt is said to be, and that it was an encounter with with their planet, one of the moons of their planet that destroyed the planet that used to be there called Maldek or Rahab, and that this is what led to the creation of the asteroid belt. And this is the, their whole creation story, the Enuma Elish, their ancient creation account. It is the unfolding of that particular tale. And then in the story of the Sumerian mythology, it speaks about how these extraterrestrial gods needing to gain access to uh, to gold that one of their uh, old kings named Alalu, that he came here to the earth and that discovering this gold, he sent forth and asked other um, of these elder extraterrestrials to join him. And so they, in the story, they came here to the earth and they began to mine the gold. And they did this in order to heal a breach upon the atmosphere of their planet. That every time the their planet Nibiru, called the crossing, came in and crossed over the ecliptic where the asteroid belt was, when they came near the sun, they would, um, their environment and their particular planet would undergo all these cataclysmic destructions. And the only way that they were able to heal that breach was to crush up the gold into powdered form and to suspend it into their atmosphere and that it would reflect enough of the sun's rays to prevent them from undergoing these ecological disasters. And so they talked about in their mythologies how they had established these bases on the moon and also on Mars the, they call them way stations uh, in order to carry the gold that they had mined here from the earth to first the moon and also to Mars and then they would transfer it to their own planet when it came near in um, what was its orbital revolution that it had a cycle of 33,600 years that called a char one char was this 3,600 years. And so they would have to be ready whenever their planet would come to cross the ecliptic. And it was at that time that they would transfer all this gold in order to prepare their planet for their the next orbit and what would be the next breach. And, you know, this shows to us now that we understand that the Bible affirms that the Earth is not one of nine planets in orbit around the sun and that it is not a luminary and that it is the foundations for the heaven and that the firmament um, encapsulating it that it is the tabernacle which the luminaries were placed into and hold circuit within that all of these stories and the assertion that you know we live in a solar system is complete fabrication and so now and this is uh, very difficult for a lot of people that have bought into and that have written many books, even myself at that time. Uh, uh, although, you know, I will always stand with truth no matter what, but for a lot of people that are invested in large, uh, as far as their career paths and their writings and, you know, in belief in the Sumerian mythos and the mythologies and that the extraterrestrials are from out there and that, you know, all these things happened in our ancient past. They came here and they created humanity. Um, it's difficult for people to overcome all of that brainwashing. And, you know, it's 
I think that the Most High God brought me through all of that first in order that I could help those of you, and especially those that are coming out of this mythos, to better understand how it connects with the Bible and prophecy and biblical cosmology and the Book of Enoch and the courses on the heavenly luminaries, all these things, because I'm able to present the fullness of the story in such manner that I can help people to understand that what the Sumerians have taught is lie and that there's reason for it. The, the real reason is not only to establish, um, you know, the Darwinian Copernican model for that we evolved of apes and that, you know, the all the stars out there are suns. They all have planetary systems around them and that they all, as long as you have a planet in the Goldilocks zone, could have, have evolved life in the same manner that we see here on the Earth and that all these millions of star systems, all these millions of people could have evolved millions of years in advance of us and what kind of high technology would they have and, you know, that these particular Nibirus, these Anunnaki, that they are those beings that came from our ancient past with the promises of coming again, that all of that is complete lies and that the reason they put forth even 6,000 years ago, I mean, wrap your mind around that, that they encoded into the cuneiform text 6,000 years ago these lies in order to establish the foundation for what is the coming of the Antichrist and the belief and which we see being pushed in this day and age so um, prevalent is that the extraterrestrials are our creators, that there is no God, that even Jesus or Yahushua was one of them, that he's an ascended master or that he's part of the great white brotherhood. I mean, the deceptions are so profound and so many, as far as Christians that are in churches where they're not receiving the truth and they're not be given insight into how to understand and make sense of all of these things, they're leaving the churches. They're abandoning them and they are ready to worship these extraterrestrial gods and they are ripe to bow down before them. And that is, in my opinion, the greatest challenge for what is this upcoming generation is to not get caught up in this strong delusion. Because, you know, those that have no love of the truth, that even the very elect could be deceived if it were possible. And that the whole Sumerian mythos shows us just how calculated, how orchestrated, and precise. I mean, we've always known that the New World, New World Order works hundreds of years out, that they've been working uh, tirelessly to orchestrate certain events and to establish a certain agenda. But as far as 6,000 years in advance, in order to bring forth the Antichrist as this extraterrestrial alien saver, I mean, that is just mind blowing. And it's hard for people to even be able to conceive and to wrap your minds around how thorough they are, how exact Lucifer is in his rebellion and his establishment of, you know, these pagan ideologies. And we're only now understanding, because we are at the end of days, the reasons why he perpetuated the lies in the manner that he did. And uh, thank God for the blessings of the Holy Spirit upon all of us and those of us that are gathered in this manner to learn the truth that we won't be caught up in the deception as most of the world will. That we will be the ones that have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the mind to understand. And that we will help as the watchmen's and watchwomen's of the world to sound the trumpet and to lead people away from such distraction and such um, illusion. And so that's what all this is really about. Amen.
Um, Viking Mop says that there needs to be a mic drop sound after each uh, profound statement. (laughs) 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 Oh, that's a great idea. (laughs) But then we'd have so many and then it would just get... (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so last question of the night um, is from Michael. Do you consider planets themselves to be three dimension uh parentheses material or just sources of light similar to the stars themselves yes the stars uh, are spiritual ethereal angelic hosts and they are not physical in embodiment even though you know god can uh, tell them to take on such form but as far as what the bible says of the luminaries that they are fire and water uh, and that they are light and water and there's no physicality to them and so um, in the chronicles of Jeremiah there's a great uh, as far as a great definition and a great uh, explanation of what the heavenly luminaries are I believe you can find that on the creation of the luminaries on day four but it tells us explicitly that the luminaries are this water and light and that they have no earth-like terraform or physicality to them and so the earth is completely different from the luminaries and the you know all that we see as far as the stars the planets and the lights in our night sky they are not earth-like in any manner and so uh, i don't see them or equate them as being planets in the traditional model of what nasa has told us of you know the a planetary system and our being one of nine planets in orbit around the sun awesome well thank you so much um it is now ten fifty nine. so that was full two hours thank you so much everyone for sending in your questions and um if you didn't hear your question today no worries we just didn't have time for it but it is on the list and we will get to it next time um once again second and fourth friday of each month so um yes thank you so much and i feel i don't know if we normally do this but i I feel like we should end in prayer i know we always start in prayer but definitely okay um please please pray for us then yes most certainly and again Uh, As the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the Alpha and Omega, the Aleph and the Toph, the beginning and the end, and all things in between. Father, we honor you and humble ourselves before you. We thank you for the Savior Messiah and the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Godhead and its reflection uh, as to the human family and that we were made and created in your image, male and female created, he, them. And so we begin with prayer and gratitude. We end with prayer and gratitude. And with all things that we do, Father, may we always remember in whatever it is to always show our gratitude and our prayerfulness and our thanksgiving and to humble ourselves in that gratitude for just all the bounty and blessings that you pour upon us. May we always remember you in every moment and dedicate our lives to being that prayerful thanksgiving and to know that uh, every moment of every day, our intent, our behaviors, our actions, that we are creating and we are manifesting for world. And so why not example and create in beauty and positivity and to share in interaction with the world and all those that come upon our pra- our paths daily the beauty of being in relationship with you and so that is my prayer going forth for this year and every day and every moment is that all of us live that prayer lord that we share it with world and that we pour out pour forth the bounty of blessings that you pour forth on us to everybody that comes upon our path and that it multiplies and that it goes forth 
and and it just overwhelms everybody and just beauty and miracle and joy and pleasure and ecstasy and and um even though this world is challenging and it's a difficult one to survive and that many people are suffering i want to always remember matthew chapter 6 verses 25 and all were to give and to leave all those things which we can't control give them all up to you and to know that we are in your grace and that you're going to take care of us no matter what that there's no need to be fearful no need to be worried or concerned about those things that are coming and that no matter what even if we are in the eye of the storm that with your protection lord we're fine we're good everything is good there's nothing to be concerned with may we live with this knowledge father and may we show that example to others so that they can also embrace it and make that um, a part of their being in your name the father the son and the holy spirit we pray amen amen and father please heal zen's throat and may he just be fully restored in health and you should say we pray man oh, thank, you. I appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much for even with your throat and even with you know everything you've been feeling for coming on and powering through these two hours thank you lord for giving him strength <laughs> yes uh, i actually i feel really good and so um, it's Crazy, been a yeah. blessing to do it. And so. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Zen, and thank you, everyone listening. And we will see you in a couple weeks. Be blessed, everyone. All right. Thank you so much. Good night, all. Shalom. Shalom. Good night.